getting connected. Hi everybody, uh, we are just waiting for some few more people to join and then we will start uh, the webinar. Hello everyone, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on what part of the world you are joining us from, for yet another thought-provoking webinar organized by the National Data Quality Forum. Uh, for all who are joining our webinar for the first time, National Data Quality Forum is a multi-stakeholder collaborative platform for a sustained dialogue among the producers and consumers of demographic and health data in India on issues related to data quality and potential solutions, and also for supporting institutionalization of promising solutions. So our today's topic, Count Everyone, is about birth and death registration in India, particularly in the states of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. As you may know, um, Government of India had enacted the registration of births and deaths act in 1969 um, uh, to promote the compulsory registration of births and deaths. The act made the registration and births and, of births and deaths compulsory in India. However, the implementation of the act has not been great and many live and die without any official proof of existence. And these varies widely by state, by district, urban, rural, their socioeconomic status, etc. Although recent data shows some improvements, we are still very far from achieving universal registration of births and deaths in the country. To talk about the reasons and implications of the age, gender, 
and social inequity in birth and death counting in the civil registration systems that we have and the bottlenecks at the health facility that needs to be addressed to increase the coverage. Uh, we have with us today Professor Rakhi Dandona. Dr. Dandona, many of you know already, is a professor of public health at the Public Health Foundation of India, Gurugram, and clinical professor at the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, University of Washington, Seattle, USA. Dr. Dandona has been involved in the Population Health Metrics Research Consortium project for the development and validation of the verbal autopsy tool and the gold standard diagnosis and cause of death assignments. She has over 280 publications in top public health uh, journals and her work has been widely referred. She serves as the chair of Global, Global Burden of Disease Study Injury Expert Group for India and is a member of the WHO Task Force uh, on Cause of Death. Professor Dandina is also a member. We are very honored to have Professor Dandina as a member of the Technical Advisory Group of the National Data Quality Forum. And she's also on the expert committee of the Health Ministry in India to improve vital registration and is incoming vice chair for the International Steel Bus Alliance. So you, you know now that she is the person, best person to talk about bartender registration and uh, the current situation and the reasons for that. We also have with us an eminent discussion. Um, again, uh, many of you know Dr. Uh, Jayan Kumar Bantia, IAS, who all of you uh, know was the Registrar General and Census Commissioner of India during 1999 and 2004, and the Chief Secretary of Government of Maharashtra during 2012 and 13. His contribution as Chief Secretary of Maharashtra to the current infrastructure of Mumbai and Navi Mumbai is very well known, particularly those people who live in Mumbai. He was instrumental in rolling out and overseeing the 2001 census. Sri Bhantia has also served in the United Nations and deputation to Nigeria as a Chief Technical Advisor to the UNFPA for over four years. So before I request Dr. Dandona to present her findings, a couple of housekeeping issues. On your screen, you have two ways to communicate with us. You can let us know about any technical issues like audio, video not working, presentation not visible, etc. to the chat button. And please post any question that you have for the panelists on the question answer button. So over to you, Dr. Landona. And thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for that kind introduction. I am not sure I'm the best person to talk about it, especially when Dr. Bantia is on the screen. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Um, I will, can you confirm if my screen is shared? Yes, just make it full screen. Yes. Yes, all, it is. Yes, all, 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 all right. right. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, so as uh, Rajiv indicated, so the conversation that we want to have today is about uh, the coverage of birth and death registration. What do we understand from what the CRBS reports tell us? And what do we understand when we do this assessment at population level? And overall, what are the issues with interpretation and, and the utilization of these data? to make life better for Indians. Uh, this was a quote uh, many, many years ago that was published in Lancet. Uh, this was a while ago. Uh, and uh, which goes on to say that there are people in Africa and Asia who are born without leaving a trace in any legal record or official status. This was called a scandal of invisibility, which renders them as unseen, uncountable, and hence uncounted. Uh, this was a series in which uh, the, uh, the idea was to raise this issue of uh, issues with vital registration system around the world, just not in India. And, and the vital registration systems around the world were rated and, and to see how the quality was in terms of completeness and the quality of data and the adequacy of data. India at that time, this was a few years ago, India at that time did not do very well as part of this assessment. So in, in this context, the conversation that we want to have today is, are we making everyone count by counting everyone? 
Uh, this is the birth registration in India, how it's changed over the last many years, 2010 to 2019. And as you can see, the birth registration coverage has actually increased from 82 to 93 percent. Uh, you would see two lines here, one for Bihar and one for UP. Those are the states where we, we did the study that I'm going to talk about today. And, and they started very low. The average for India was 82, and these, these two states were at 79 and 45. And they have also gone up a fair bit over the last many years. Death registration is not as good in these states as the birth registration is. For India, death registration in 2019 was at 92%. And for these two states, Bihar has still got only half the deaths, and UP is 63% of deaths that are being registered. So in this context is when we undertook the study in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh to understand how do we count how many are born and how do we count how many actually die given that these registrations seemed incomplete. Uh, we did two things to understand this. One was community survey and the other was health facility survey. So the initial findings that I will talk about are from community survey. In Bihar, we had a rural sample. R R uh, Bihar, 70% of the population is rural, so it's fairly representative of the state, um, where we covered a fair bit of population to 300,000. And the sample of assessment was births, which is live births and stillbirths that, were, that occurred in the year 2019 and 2020. Deaths were covered for the last three years, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Uh, UP, it's the largest state. Uh, we did only five districts in UP, but the way these five districts were selected kind of were represented, which was a combination of high birth and high death registration to low birth and low death registration and in between. So Agra had the best um, registration coverage and Sonbatra had the worst. And this was the population covered in UP, and the years for birth and deaths were similar. In the community survey, for every life birth that we identified and every death that we identified, we did this interview to document where the place of birth was, public sector, private sector, home, similarly for deaths, the usual demography for all the births and deaths, and whether the birth registration um, was done. And here, the answer was just not yes and no. For someone who said, yes, the birth registration is done, we asked for the availability of birth certificate to document if the birth certificate was available. So this is how we arrived at to understand that whether the birth was actually registered or not. We also had details on the process of registration, when it was registered, how it was registered, and from whom. And for those who had not registered birth or death, we wanted to understand why they had not registered. And there were some other awareness and rating questions. What did we find? We found underreporting of births, not, an, not ex unexpected, but the extent of underreporting was a bit of a surprise. In Bihar, we found one in three live births do not exist officially. And I'm using live births specifically because stillbirths are not part of what I'm presenting today. Um, just a note on stillbirths, almost none, no, none of the stillbirths were reported. So it's a bigger issue which we can deal with separately. And UP, two out of five live births did not exist officially. So there's, they had no birth registration, no birth certificate. So they were actually not registered as officially as part of being here in India. On the death side, 54% of deaths were not reported, not registered. This translates to about four in seven, which is similar for UP and Bihar. Uh, for ease of understanding today, I will talk about findings from Bihar. The findings for UP were not very different. It's easier to talk about Bihar at state level, so I will do that from this slide onwards. This is the coverage of um, birth registration in Bihar as per the CRVS reports. Uh, for 2020, we had to extrapolate the coverage because it wasn't readily available in the report. Um, and we found that in the sample that we had, but the, uh, we had lower birth registration coverage as compared with what the CRVS report uh, suggested. Similarly, death coverage was also different. We had one year where we had slightly higher uh, death registration in our sample, 
but otherwise the death registration coverage in our sample was lower than that reported in the PR. So the, given these differences, the idea was to understand, are these two data sets comparable? And if not, what are the reasons between the differences across these coverages? Now, the basic difference for birth and data actually is similar. Now, for a birth uh, registration coverage, what you need is the number of births that have the birth is registered, and denominator is the number of uh, actually this is the, uh, the number of total births, and the numerator is the number of births that have birth registration. Now, for our survey, what and I'm taking example of year 2019. So, for the survey to calculate coverage in 2019. Our denominator was, were all births that happened in 2019, and our numerator were births that happened in 2019 and were registered. And, and but for the CRVS report, the, the denominator is the estimated number of births in a given year based on the crude birth rate, and the numerator is the number of births registered in that year, irrespective of the year of birth which basically means that if someone were to register a birth in 2019, it is possible that the birth happened in 2019. It is also possible that the birth happened in 2018, 2017, or 2016, because we know that people register birth as the need arises, especially in less developed uh, states. So the big difference is that for the survey calculation for our coverage, the numerator and denominator were in a fixed set of population, which is not so for CRVS report. And this is also the, uh, the difference in the methods in the survey for death and for a CRVS report. This corroborates very well with the fact that not all births get registered within that 21 days, um, which is where it's free of cost. And, and the idea is to, in, to generate momentum for people to register births and deaths as soon as possible. Now in Bihar, we found that only 44% uh, only of births were registered in 21 days, uh, which means that if we were to do this study, let's say three years later, and to document if birth registration had happened for this particular cohort, we would possibly find coverage which is similar to what the CRVS report says. Because the, as the need for the certificate arises, the, the coverage of certification increases. So in our sample, the average age for, for these births were one and a half years and eight months, and they were not go closer to school going age. So our assumption is as this age becomes closer to school going age, this the registration of, of the birth uh, would change and get higher closer to as the CRVS report. Uh, the need for death is slightly difficult to, um, to define. Uh, for birth certificate, it's easier to say schooling age because that's how it's, it's understood in the community. Uh, but there is no apparent need for death registration um, other than financial uh, incentive, which could be pension related, which could be property related, life insurance related. So it was a bit more difficult to figure out when the need would arise in a given population for the death registration to go up. Again, uh, like birth registration, death registration within 21 days was only for about half of these deaths. Uh, for those who did not register, uh, we asked them why. And as you can see, for younger age groups, did not think about it or no need for it was cited by people. And for greater than 15 years, again, no need for it or will get it when the need arises. So again, clearly there are ways, which means that if the need doesn't really arise at the household level for a death to be registered, then it is likely that the death will not register. So it kind of highlights the importance of systems responsibility to make sure that we are able to count these deaths, even though at population levels, people don't see the need to count these deaths. The other question that we asked was that if this was happening at the coverage level, then how do we understand who is actually reported in the CRVS? So when we say that X number of births got registered and X number of deaths got registered, which are these births and which are these deaths? The idea was to understand who are we missing? 
birth registration. Uh, so when we look at, because we documented place of birth delivery, uh, we, and, and we understood process across each, it was very clear that the birth in Bihar and in UP, the births that happened in private facilities and at home had much lower coverage for birth certificate or birth registration as compared with public facility births. So clearly one bias is that the many of the numbers that we see in, in the CRBS report are actually public sector births, at least for the less developed set. And this bias would be in the states where you have less number of births, proportion of births being registered within 21 days. So the, uh, the two pie charts I showed, as the, as the proportion of births and deaths getting registered within 21 days will go up, this bias will disappear. Similarly, the other interesting thing what we found was that the babies who died within the neonatal period, so this is the first uh, one month of uh, birth, they were the least likely to have their birth registered, right? Because these babies were born and died within that period. So the assumption was that if the baby has already died, we don't need a, uh, we don't need a birth or a death certificate. And this trend was good irrespective of what type of facility you looked at. Now, this is babies who survived the neonatal period, and this is babies who died during the neonatal period. So here you see, public, you see public sector birth had a really high coverage for babies who survived. But look at the coverage here, that was only one third. So even at public facility, that coverage dropped. And it dropped even further for private sector and home birth. So the babies who died within the first month of birth were less likely to have birth registration. And these were the reasons given, the ones on the or inside, baby died soon after birth, child was too young because the baby died, you really don't need it. For death registration, we looked at which deaths were more likely to be registered. And, and this in no order of priority, but it, it shows that men, so when men die, when adults die, when people belonging to higher wealth index die, and when the death is associated with a financial incentive, which could mean that the disease was working, which typically happens to be male. For the most part, disease had property. Again, within the Indian cost, uh, context, this is more men than women. Disease had a bank account or disease had life insurance. So anywhere where we saw financial benefit associated, we had a higher coverage of death registration. Again, nothing new, but this is more like you know, having an evidence for it now. And the medical legal cases, uh, like the, any type of injuries, a road accident, suicide. So they had a higher chance of being registered because they anyway get reported within the police system. Now, I will take you through some detail here to understand the implications of this in terms of interest rates. Now, when you look at the age and sex differential, because I said adults and men, which means that younger populations and females are less likely to register. Now, this black line here is the average for the state, which was 44.6, right, for death registration. This is how when I put males and females together just by age. So if you look at this is the death registration. So it is really low at the end in the younger age groups, and it increases and is fairly higher than the average for the state here, 70 percent in, in this age group. And it is very different when you split it by male and you split it by female. So if you can see the female line blue is always under the combined line and male line is always above the average combined line, which is also true for UP. So clearly the, the, the data shows us, the bias is that what you have is these deaths. What's missing is these deaths. So there's no record that these people have died. So the record is biased towards these deaths in less developed states where the coverage is low. This is the difference. And if you look at the neonatal deaths, which is which we found that you know they or they had less birth registration, they also then had less death registration. 
Uh, the logic is simple. If you don't register a birth, you can't register a death. Someone has to be born to die. So what happened is for these babies who die within the first 30 days, 20 days officially, let's say one month, so you have no registration of their birth and you have no registration of their death. So this truly is the scandal of invisibility that I showed, I raised the question in, in, in the first slide. So there are these babies who have never been registered. Um, we don't know that these babies were actually ever born in India, uh, given the system that's been followed. The death registration by the type of the place of death was fairly similar, which was a bit of a surprise. Our assumption was that maybe the public facility deaths would be higher, like what we saw in, in birth. But here, what's interesting was that they were not very different, the, the registration between deaths at public, private facility, and at home. The major bias that we see on the birth side was that babies who survived neonatal period are more in that data and public sector births. And for deaths, we saw that it's mostly men and the deaths where it's linked to a financial incentive. Then we looked at, you know, what could be the bottlenecks, um, especially for public sector, uh, to improve birth and death registration coverage. Uh, this, and we took a facility survey in Bihar and in UP and across a variety of public sectors, so all levels, um, both in UP and Bihar. Uh, we undertook a detailed business process analysis to understand what happens when a death happens at the public sector facility. How is it notified? What, what is, what happens with registration? What does HMIS tell us about it? Is it possible to track these deaths from facility to HMIS to the portal and the capacity and resources that the system has to carry out the entire process? What did we find? We found that notification and registration were considered almost synonymous by public health facility staff, which basically means that the, the facility had, for example, 50 deaths, for example, in a year, but not all of those 50 deaths were in the CRVS portal. The deaths, let's say, for example, were only 10 or 20. So they had this list of 50 but only 10 or 20 of them were entered in the portal and, and registered and certificate issued. And the simple reason what, what we understood when we talked to the data entry operator and the facility staff was that they are waiting for someone, a family to show up to ask for the death certificate and that's when they will enter these deaths in the CRVS portal and generate a certificate. So they were not really notifying deaths, they were just sitting on that piece of information and waiting for family to come and ask for a certificate to start the entire uh, process. And it was not possible to do the birth and death tracking, but we did a manual tracking and I'll get into those details. Now we also, um, so we combined what we understood from the community in terms of, you know, uh, if, a, if a, a birth happened at public sector, what was the process of getting the, you know, birth certificate? So oh, this is the number of births in public sector in Bihar, um, um, which is about 64% of all births in our sample, so which is fairly good. 80% of them had a birth certificate, which is again fantastic. But interestingly, only half of them actually received or got the certificate at the public facility where the birth had happened. And uh, the others actually went home and got it done elsewhere. They did not get the birth certificate process done at the facility where the birth happened. Even though the public sector facilities are mandated to do that entire process. And what's also interesting is that of these half of them who had the birth certificate, received the birth certificate at the public facility, all of them came later to get it. It wasn't at the time of delivery. So there are practical reasons for it. And the big practical reason is that the name for the baby is not given at the time of birth. You know, Within our context, social cultural context, the name is decided later and people do not want to you know, come, uh, come and change the name of the baby. So they want to do the process only once. Uh, but there are ways now um, in which you can get over this. But the point here is that this is why we are missing out 
on, on understanding who gets counted. And if these are the babies who then die later, people will not come back for the certificate. And if, if they get go home and the baby dies, they are not getting the certificate. So this is why we are missing out babies who die within the first month of birth. A similar situation was seen with deaths, not very different. The only difference here was that most people got death certificate from elsewhere, not from the facility where they had died and only 30%, and of these 30%, all of them had come later uh, for the uh, birth certificate to be collected. Then we looked at how do we understand at the public facility level, which deaths get entered and which deaths don't get entered. The number, just not which deaths, which we understood from community. As I said, it was not possible. There's no system that allows you to match the two systems. So what we did was a lot of manual tracking for both births and deaths. Uh, we collected in a given time period, we collected all the births that had happened and all the deaths that have happened and matched for name, sex, date of birth and date of death um, for these births and deaths with what was entered in the CRVS portal. And this is what we found. Birth tracking, because the birth coverage is higher, as we know, we could find 70% of these births in the CRVS portal. 22% uh, were not entered. There were 8% where partial matching happened. So either the sex of the baby was incorrect or the name of the baby was incorrect or the mother, but it seemed like they were talking about the same baby. So about 78% in total. Death tracking was completely the opposite. 87% of deaths were not entered in the system, exactly what I said. So there is information of these deaths, but they were waiting for someone to ask for a birth certificate to notify these within the CRVS portal. I'll just take one example as to what does it all mean in terms of, you know, it's okay, we don't understand this from the CRVS report. This is a problem with notification. So what is the implication? Why are we talking about this? Now, I take a simple example, which India is committed to, and a lot of our national program focuses on maternal and child health. So SDG target 3.2, where we are committed to, along with other countries, to reduce our neonatal mortality and child mortality by 2030. So if you take the example, the understanding that we have from our survey, this is all the babies who um, uh, neonatal deaths in Bihar that we found in our sample. And 75% of them had neither birth registration nor death registration. It's logic is simple. If you don't register birth, you can't register death. So 75% has no record at all of ever being born or dead within the system. Uh, there is 24% uh, with birth certificate available, and there is very little where you have both birth and death certificate available. Now, if I simply extrapolate this, to the uh, number of births, live births that happen in Bihar, it actually translates into a lot of numbers. So if you have 70,000 babies dying within the first month in Bihar, zero will actually um, have a death certificate and most of them, 75% of them will have none. So this again speaks in terms of numbers to the scandal of invisibility that I raised earlier. So if I were to look at what we have found and still answer this question, are we making everyone count by counting everyone? The answer perhaps is no, certainly not in the less developed states where the coverage of uh, births and deaths is low and the, coverage and, and the coverage within the first 21 days is low. Uh, it's important to remember that the situation could be different and would be different in states where the coverage within 21 days and overall coverage for birth and death registration is high. I want to thank our, 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 uh, our collaborators. We had CARE in um, Bihar, uh, OPM in Bihar, and Sambodhi in UP as partners in this work. And this work was supported by the AIDS Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Raki. Um, this is an excellent work and very important work. Uh, we will discuss uh, 
with the audience later on. But before that, um, I would like to invite Dr. Bhantia to share his comments and his views. Um, Tisha, can you present his slide? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, Dr. Rajiv, congratulations to Dr. Rakhi and her team. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Good. Okay, so congratulations to Dr. Rakhi and her team. Dr. Rakhi, in spite of being unwell, has done a wonderful job in making the presentation and obviously a great survey to all the audience and the other people who are around. Well, let me greet them for the festivals. Today is Ganpati, second day in Maharashtra, so happy Ganpati to everybody. And I'll try to address some of the issues which uh, Dr. Rakhi mentioned. Let me say at the outset uh, very clearly, uh, things have improved as uh, was shown by Dr. Rakhi based on the ORGI reports. But really, when you unravel, I don't think things have really improved considerably to an extent that uh, we can still look at CRVS. And several uh, critical analysis done by renowned demographers in the country and outside, some or the other, in my view, are giving an impression that things are better and better and CRVS is sort of beginning to be usable. I think it is far from dead, uh, that status, etc. And I'm just taking out some of the bullet points from Dr. Rakhi's presentation. Uh, Bihar registration coverage in Bihar is lower than CRVS report. So she has talked about that. Uh, what is for Bihar and UP should be true for a larger number of states in the major states. I'm not getting repeating some of these things, but she made a very important point, uh, which she explained also numerator is not necessarily from the denominator. And this has been an issue which has been raised by people who are looking at district level and sub-district level CRVS data, basically. Uh, the reported births and the reported deaths do not relate to that here necessarily in majority of the cases because of the drives, etc. A lot of pressure is put on people to register. Uh, people means the uh, data entry operators and previous years, births and deaths get registered and inflate numbers creating lots of issues over there. But her important point was as to who is responsible, sort of, for not registering births and deaths. Uh, more or less the issues are given here. Uh, apparently everybody is trying to say that people are the culprit, public at large is the culprit, which I do not agree generally in any case. Uh, she has given reasons, no idea where to register and you see the annual reports, either of the state or from the ORGI, huge reports on about what is being done to improve the IEC. And, and if this is the status here, which then it is obviously a problem. They do not think that it is important, etc. Imagine half of the population does not think that it is important. Uh, so there are several issues and therefore there's something fundamentally wrong. And that is what I propose to discuss towards the end. Next slide, please. So what I've tried to do is take a 15, 16 years uh, summary over the years and just see how difficult or easy it is basically which task. Obviously, it is extremely challenging. UP and Bihar put together, if you see uh, the registration contributions from whatever were the registered births in India, they have jumped, as you will see the last row, 17% to now a staggering 32%, 33%, it looks very impressive, obviously. But what is the real story? As you will just see, this is the registered birth, not against the estimated birth. And the picture is pretty gloomy as we will see further. So things have improved on the face of it. Things look uh, improved over the districts, but that is not the true story. And I'll take you through next slide, please. Okay, so this is the story of the registered deaths. Obviously, if you just see over a 16 year period, 
Bihar's contribution is barely improved, and UP apparently seems to have fallen down in some sense. And if you look at the total registered birth deaths, it is 16, 17 percent, not more than that, actually. Uh, what should be the contribution of UP and Bihar, the two most numerically important states in the country? Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is for the re registered infant deaths. This, it is pathetic to say the least. Uh, just, just see what is UP, apparently in 2009, etc. contributed 20,000 infant deaths. In 2020 and previous years, it is very close to 10,000. Uh, I do not know how when we say things are improving, it beats me honestly. And Bihar, less said the better. Even in, reportedly 2009, it had 8,500 infant deaths reported. 2015, 233 for the entire state. Around 2,000, 2,500 in the previous three years, etc. I'm wondering, nobody asked any questions either in the state or in government of India or anywhere else. Surprising. Let's go ahead. Okay, so I took 2015 because this was the ready data. What is the contribution of the population from UP and VR? Around 25%, uh, which is the last row. If you see the estimated births based on the SRS rates for them, and it has not changed substantively, is very close to one third of all estimated births should be taking place in two. And estimated this is almost a, more than one fourth over there. And the levels of registrations, they seem to be impressive. They are more impressive now, as was presented by Dr. Raki. And surprisingly, um, uh, when you look at the NFHS 5 data, district level data, all the other data, I mean, the picture is presented as very rosy, actually, which is, I think, considered misleading. And I think a lot of us, especially the demographers and statisticians are being carried away by such uh, findings, honestly, and we need to look much deeper into that. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so is everything right, everything bad? Well, I don't think it is so bad a situation. I put this 2015 sex ratios at birth in Uttar Pradesh. Out of 76 districts, as many as 67, is well below 950, 950, 955 is what we expect to be the sex ratio at birth if all things are equal. And it is as low as 542, less than 808 districts. What it could be the problem? Is it widespread female feticide? Widespread under reporting of female births or both? And if you just see the districts which are there on the right hand panel, beginning from Pilibi to Chandoli. These are the SRBs over there. I think they have not changed much uh, in the current year as well, etc. So do sex ratio at birth in spite of under-reporting, do tell us the story, uh, both on the wider under-reporting, under-registration of the female births and of the female feti side. As all of you know, I mean, we have been looking not at the census to tell us what is happening or look at the NFSS data as to what is happening to female feticide. CRVS is the only answer to that. So we cannot wait for 10 years and with the census being sort of uh, extended, we do not know when the 2021 census will. We are at a loss to understand what's happening to sex ratio at birth, notwithstanding the SRS giving the estimated sex ratio at birth. So there is a big issue, obviously, in addition to the about invisibility, so there are hundreds of other implications as to why CRUS needs to be improved. Next, please. Okay, so this is Bihar for the same year, 2015. Out of 38, 33 districts reported sex ratio well below 950. These are the five districts which presented uh, really, really, sort of uh, balanced sex ratios at birth. So there is an issue with the CRVS data, but still it is telling stories of sex ratio at birth, actually at a district level and maybe at a sub-district level. As I said, it's a case of female feticide multiplied or added on with the under-reporting of female births. Could this be improved? Which are the districts which are having stable data are issues of details, but 
we are looking at aggregates unfortunately and that is why there is a problem next more scandalous in my view is the infant deaths reported by some of these states bihar and up in 2015 bihar as a state reported 233 infant deaths it's is un unimaginable what what can be the problem on that and how is it that nobody is being questioned on this etc and look at the still birth rate for the same uh, state and the same uh, year 12462 still births obviously all of us know that uh, to hide the infant mortality infant deaths are converted into still births so a state and in districts where infant deaths cannot be reported or under reported still report still births are reported left right and center and all the 38 districts are reported whereas if we see infant deaths only 11 districts have reported so the position is really really pathetic every report is being produced year after year by the orgi by the state chief registrar etc we are turning a blind eye to all these things etc so the issue of invis invisibility is much more on every count actually sir next please okay so what i did is i said well let's not take 2015 let's like 2020 the last available report and just see what is happening in the country as a whole more so in bihar and up well if you just see still births are reported much higher in the country as a whole as the infant deaths but this is particularly really really problematic when you look at bihar and uttar pradesh bihar reports as high as 9000 still births against 2300 infant deaths urban area 55 still births where majority of the uh, births are taking place reportedly up 28000 still births against 8700 infant deaths so there are huge issues and there are obviously reasons for that etc etc and let's get into some of these things as we move ahead next please okay so we have talked about uh, the huge workload on the registrants in these two states let's see what has happened Uh, over these six years, 2015 to 2020, India as a whole improved its number of registration units from 2 lakh 72,000 to 2 lakh 92,000. Bihar, on the other hand, has reduced its number of registration units, 9,265 in 2015, 9,143. In 2020, I don't know. Nobody seems to be looking at anything in my view. Actually, this is a, we produce these reports blindly. We sign these reports blindly. In some sense, obviously there are people responsible, and we'll have to have a look at this. The reporting, corresponding reporting, seems very impressive. In spite of that, in Bihar, from 651 percent, it has jumped to 99 percent, and. for rural area and urban area from 80% to 90 reporting everybody is reporting what are they reporting if zero births and zero deaths is being reported is it treated as a reporting but the state of bihar seems to be reporting 100% in 2020 which means every single registration unit is reporting events of all kinds i do not know who looks at into all this etc look at uttar pradesh uttar pradesh has the slightly better from close to 52000 rural registration unit it has gone to 60000 from 649 it has doubled to 1225 and we have seen stability of reporting but reporting for what what are they really reporting nobody is asking these questions actually or we are asking because when you look into the report how many uh, registration units visited inspected etc etc impressive reports are given in the org annual reports for all these years let's go to the next level okay so on the previous slide 
I gave you an idea about the number of registration units and look at this registration hierarchy in the state and these are the fundamental questions which need to be asked. Why things are not changing? Who is looking at these reports? Why are we not continuing to have the same structure for reporting, registration, certification, etc. Et Dr. Rakhi mentioned about the challenges in reporting, which is notifying, recording, which is registration, certificates is a terrible story, is what she mentioned. And look at who are the registrars here. The registrars, Bihar has not changed, neither has UP over these years. Anganwadi worker is a sub registrar. I do not know what she is doing really. And medical officers of civil hospitals, PACs, both in UP, etc. That is the registrar level. Up above, it is all mess. District magistrates, they go transfer in six months' time, one year's time, one and a half year's time. They have no idea that they are even responsible as registrars, etc. You have the district statistical officer who has no control over medical people or the Anganwadi worker or this panchayat saver, same story is in UP. And at the higher level, just see who are the people there. In UP, you have director urban and director rural who have no idea as to what is all this, etc. So the, there are fundamental structural issues which have remained unattended. Next slide, please. So some of this question, who is responsible for this mess? Is somebody accountable for this mess? I'm daring to call it as a mess because as Dr. Raki mentioned, if you have to do the SDGs, et cetera, et cetera, unless these two states perform, nothing can be done. So the standard answer is public is responsible. They are not aware. They are illiterate. There's no request. There's no demand. They are not aware. I don't think that's correct. We have talked about the political comment and all the African seminars, etc., etc., talk about the involvement of the political executives. They have a role to play, etc. Yes, they have a role to play. There's no doubt about it. But I don't think that is the real issue, etc. We have been talking about lack of funds. Well, lack of funds with ORGI is definitely an issue, but lack of funds with the state and lack of funds with the Ministry of Health is definitely not an issue. NHM, NRHM were expected to provide funds. They are supposed to get the basic data. So it boils down to the registrar or somebody else. And who is, can we really help the registrar? They re require a reorientation of hundreds of different kinds, etc. They require support or there's somebody else. And other than the registrars, are the secretaries of medical health, public health departments in the state or the government of India or people in the ORGI and other people, they also need to take something with them. That is the question which we need to answer if we have to really make an answer. Uh, I'll try to talk about some of the things Dr. Raki mentioned in the next one or two minutes. Legal record. Can you, sir, can you uh, please wrap up in two minutes because you have a lot of questions coming. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'll do that. I'll do that. Thank okay. you, sir. So, uh, I will not get into the recording, reporting, etc. But there are success stories in other parts of the country, and there are success stories which I would like to share. I think maybe I'll request NDQ to give me some time a lot. Uh, thank you for this. Next, please. Thank you for this opportunity and time. And uh, thanks, Dr. Raki, and thanks to NDQ. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. When you speak, it shows your passion about civilization system and how deeply you think about the problems and identify the issues at different levels. Um, so we have a few questions. I, we don't have much time. We have only five minutes, but we can extend for a few more minutes. Uh, I, but there is one, uh, Trisha, can we allow uh, Ms. Varsha who wanted to speak and ask a question. Sure. Yeah, Ms. Varsha, can you ask a question? No, it may be a false alarm for us. Okay, no problem. 
Uh, so uh, there are questions. This is one for Dr. Rakhi. Uh, Dr. Niranjan is asking excellent work and presentation. What can reduce the discrepancy between health facility records and CRVS registration? Is it a behavioral issue or structural challenge from both ends? I think even Dr. Vantia can also partially answer this question. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Niranjan. Um, I think this is a very large issue, but I think the solutions have to be found in a very simple manner. I think the bigger challenge that we have is that the data that's to be used by health health ministry is actually being collected by um, another department and there is no accountability, there is no coordination between the two. Um, um, and HMIS itself within the ministry at the facility level, the quality of data within the deaths and births is also not, not that great. So I think it is, it is the issue of understanding the utilization of this data across whether you talk about it in the vital registration system or within the health ministry at the facility level as well. Uh, the uh, behavioral issues are, are also there. Some of the behavioral issues are very simple. For example, if the data entry operator has told us that, you know, we are sitting on this data, but we're waiting for someone to come and ask for it, ask for a certificate and we'll enter. So this is a clearly behavioral issue, training issue, understanding issue. But it is also the issue of accountability at that health facility level, which again highlights the fact that the systems are disjointed. Um, which is also very obvious at that, Angan, uh, at that Anganwadi level. Even if you have Anganwadi workers in Bihar also as facilitators for death and birth registration, they would help only mostly the public sector uh, births and deaths. They will not help private sector births and deaths. So there is an issue in terms of you know what understanding the staff, whether it's at the health facility level, whether it's at the outreach level, in understanding you know, what is meant by that. Um, with the FGDs, with the um, Anganwadi workers and ANMs in both the states, it was clearly highlighted that the, min the health ministry push conversation is about service indicators for maternal and child health. It's not about birth and death registration. So they do not understand why it is important for them to register these within the catchment population that they have. So it's a so to answer your question simply, it is certainly a behavioral issue, but it starts from elsewhere. Uh, these structural changes have to come that vertical down till the health facility and outreach level for this accountability within the system has to happen of this data and utilization for things to actually change on ground. Thank you. Dr. Panthia, we want to say anything? I would summarize in one sentence. There is a citizen's charter. The law is very clear that the certificate has to be given. The very fact that the birth has taken place in the facility and it has been registered over there, the question of people coming and asking for it doesn't arise. It's absolute carelessness on the part of all authorities. Nothing less, nothing more. Thank you, sir. So there's a question from Dr. Praveen Jha, whether the registration authorities at the community and higher levels are covered under the study by Dr. Rakhi. If yes, what was responses for low registration? Uh, fantastic question. So, um, so for this study, we actually did not um, uh, do interviews with the registrars, sub-registrars, you know, at the district and state level. And once we started analyzing the data and we saw how the actually when we understood the process at public sector level, which is when we, we realized that that component within what we've done uh, needs attention as well. It wasn't designed as part of the study. Uh, taking these findings forward, we are now doing a study with other collaborators in six states where this is a big part as well, understanding from the system uh, the vital registration system across this, at till the district level to understand, uh, you know, what they do and why there are these issues. And in addition to this, which I haven't presented today, cause of death is another big challenge. So today we've just talked about birth and death registration. So that study is about death registration and also improvement in medically certified cause of death for Indians. So we would 
hopefully presented in one of the NDQR seminars next year. Raki, I have another question for you. Count is always synonymous with census. Why do you have, why have you coined this particular word for registration? So when you say everyone counts, it generally resonates with the counting everybody in the census. Oh, so it's it's not, I, 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 I see where you're coming from, but it's just saying that the, the, it stresses the fact that it's systems accountability and ownership needs to happen to count everyone. Um, and that's the connotation of this term. And as also Dr. Banjia said, at some point we have to stop saying that it's populations or communities' responsibility to deal with birth and death registration. But what we are saying with this terminology, which is quite well used within the vital uh, improvements in vital legislation, is that the system needs to count everyone. Uh, so that counting could be as part of census, which doesn't happen every year. Uh, but this counting, this counting needs to happen for us to know what's actually changing at population level in terms of births and deaths, and of course, as cause of death as well. Ali, I would like to add to what Dr. Aki mentioned. The simple answer, what she mentioned count and what is mentioned in the vital registration system is related to the identity of the person, which is not with the census, first of all. Okay, in census, you count everybody irrespective of citizenship, et cetera, et cetera. Birth registration is extremely critical in counting in terms of your identity, both not as an individual, but as a citizen, actually. It's your legal identity. Census is not a legal identity. So counting is totally different for the two different purposes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Raki. So, um, Raki, somebody, uh, okay. This is Pail Hathi. She is asking, um, what avenues are there to encourage people to register early? Uh, I mean, why people, I mean, of course, you have talked about the reasons for not, uh, you know, registering early. If there is a need, then they come and uh, register. So what can be done to improve that early registration? You mean early registration, I'm assuming within oh, 21 God. days. And that's both, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's it's not a simple answer, Pail. I think it, it relates to what me and Dr. Banjia have been in saying as part of this conversation, that it's time that in the short term and medium term at least, the accountability of counting everyone needs to be on the system, right? Uh, the IEC is needed, but IEC can take us so far only i mean in at the, in the long term you would once the system sets in people understand that it's not the need at personal level but it's an important process documentation that you have to have for every birth and every death but we are far away from that uh, you have examples of increase only IECs around birth because it's easy to relate it to school admission it's easy to relate it to an identity or a document because you need it elsewhere for things, you know, date of birth. Uh, we have, we looked at around the world in less developed settings to see if there were any IEC activities that actually made a difference for death registration. Interestingly, no, because the death registration in culturally is dependent on the need, unless of course you live in, you live in setting where it's part of normal process. Now for birth registration, because most of the births happen at institute, at institutional births, it's very less home births in India now, the system could be made accountable for birth registration. There is uh, there is no, uh, as Dr. Bhante said, you have to register this birth before the child leaves the, uh, the uh, facility. Hospital. For death, it's slightly different because for, in India, deaths mostly happen at home, so which is slightly different. But IEC is not the solution there. The solution still needs to be within the uh, within the system, and I'll give you a quick example. I know we're running out of time. At the village level, you look at the pension data, you know, which is maintained by Sarpanch. The pension data is fairly more updated about the fact that person who is having pension has died because the pension needs to stop, right? But that information is not necessarily available elsewhere. So at systems level, there is ways to connect information or to build accountability at that village administration level to make sure that every death that happens actually is accounted for. 
IEC is not the solution in, in the immediate long term for India. Rajiv, I'll just add to Dr. Raki and I'll address the issue about the death. I think primarily it is the responsibility of the government. Government is the single biggest stakeholder in ensuring death are registered. It's their responsibility statutorily, but otherwise. You want to update the voters list, voters registration. You cannot do it without that. And government is responsible for that. Government is doing that. You want to update the, your other database, etc. You require to do that. You want to improve your ration card delivery system because people who are dead do not require. So primarily death registration and most of these deaths, as we know, are now taking place at higher ages, etc. The number of infant and child deaths is increasingly getting smaller and smaller. And all these are straight away responsible in government schemes. So government is the single biggest holder and government is shying away from this. As simple as that. And as Dr. Raki mentioned, birth registration is much simpler now with a higher institutional deliveries. There's no reason birth cannot take register. I'm really shocked that it does not take place even in places like UP and Bihar of the facility births. What she has not mentioned is the cross uh, uh, communication which is required from the private facility because the number of births in private facility is very high in all these states, including these two. That is a ridiculously complex system which has been made. So this is not the time, but she understands and I understand this. Thank you, sir. I mean, I, we have completely uh, run out of time. I just wanted to mention two questions and they can be answered later on. For example, uh, Krishna Kumar says that whether the methodological problem with distributing level of data registration can be explained by Dr. Raki again. Maybe you can look at the presentation which will be available through the video that we'll post. And if there's, a pro if there's still questions, you can write to us and we'll forward that uh, question to Dr. Raki. So the Nutan Kumari says that there are three vital events in life, birth, death, and marriage. And then why we are not talking about marriage registration. And maybe at some point of time, some other day, we'll definitely talk about it, uh, Nutan. Thank you for reminding us about that. Rajiv, I've given my mail and phone number. People, if they want to contact me, they can. For any sure, other. sure. If anybody has a question for any of the uh, panelists, please write to us and we will definitely um, get you in touch with them. Uh, thank you. I will just say thank you to both of you. And I can't um, say enough uh, how how well this presentation went and how how well the I mean, how these findings are so important uh, for us to understand and take these learnings forward. Uh, thank you, both of you. Um, Raki being always supportive to NDQF and being a member of our TAG. And Dr. Bantia also came a couple of times for our TAG meetings and uh, other meetings. So uh, thank you for your support to NDQF and uh, for these presentations and discussions today. Thank you so much. And thank you, thank you Tisha so much, and you. Himanshi, uh, who worked at the background. Thanks to NDQF thank and to Dr. Raki for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very thank happy with this you. opportunity, Raji. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Bantia, for discussing this with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank Dr. you, all the participants. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.